you to join in our responsive reading. I'm going to read it so I can introduce our greeter today. Together, let us share the words printed in your order of worship. Out of wood and stone, out of dreams and sacrifice, the people build a home. Out of the work of their hands and hearts and minds, the people fashion a symbol and a reality. May this house be a truly a place of meeting. Meeting one another in faith, hope, and love. Indeed, indeed. Our greeter today is Ms. Katie Gordon, who is, are you, you're not the executive director, but you are a staffer for the Kaufman Inter Interfaith Institute. Please come up here. And we may remember Mr. Doug Kinchy, who is the executive director. This is an institute that's been uh, put in place some years ago, and I'd love for you to tell, tell everyone a little bit about it, but I wanted you to know that you're not a stranger to the church, but you may not know her yet. Katie, welcome to our Thank house. Thank you, Fred. Thank you. Uh, I'm Katie Gordon, and I'm the program manager at the Kaufman Interfaith Institute, where I've been working for almost three years now. And as Fred mentioned, the Kaufman Interfaith Institute has been in Grand Rapids and housed at Grand Valley State University for just over five years. I think 2010 was when it started. But it's an interfaith initiative that's existed in West Michigan, starting in Muskegon, since the late 80s, actually, as Jewish, uh, Jewish Christian dialogue at first, and it's been ever expanding sense and is now inclusive of all religious, spiritual, and secular traditions, and we bring people together to encourage dialogue and service projects. So as the program manager, that's essentially what I do is organize programs both in the community and on campus at Grand Valley State and on multiple campuses as well, including Aquinas College and Kelvin College, where we have interfaith interns helping us as well. Um, and we really encourage interfaith understanding and respect across our religious differences. And the theme that um, is today, Pluralism Sunday, uh, is so central to what we do at the Kaufman Institute. We really take into account what Diana Eck of the Pluralism Project at Harvard University says, um, where she, she dis, uh, distinguishes the difference between diversity, which is a fact. You know, we are a diverse country, we are a diverse community. Pluralism is the next step. What are we gonna do with that diversity? And pluralism, she says, is the intentional engagement with that diversity. Um, and as Ibu Patel says, which I know is in your program as well, um, we can either engage with diversity positively or negatively. And so what we try to do as the Kaufman Institute in Grand Rapids and on campuses is to make that positive engagement across our religious differences. And the understanding of religious pluralism that we have, there's really three tiers to it. One, we respect people's diverse religious and non-religious identities. Two, we try to encourage mutually inspiring relationships between people of different backgrounds. And three, we encourage common action for the common good based on those shared values that we have in our distinct traditions. There's one event that um, happened just a couple months ago that I think really encapsulates what, what religious pluralis pluralism looks like in action, and it was called Welcoming Refugees Do Unto Others. As a part of that event that we held at the Catholic Information Center, we had 60 co-sponsors, including Fountain Street Church, multiple uh, religious organizations, secular organizations, businesses, restaurants, civic agencies, the city, um, come together, and uh, over 400 people ended up coming that night to talk about how we can make Grand Rapids a welcoming city of our new Americans um, coming from oftentimes war-torn countries. 
um, and really centering this on the principle that all of our faith and moral traditions call us to welcome the other and call us to create a welcoming community. And so how can we use that shared value and, into, and put it into an action in Grand Rapids and make sure that we are welcoming of everyone coming into Grand Rapids? And so that's a little bit about what we do, and I know that Fountain Street is always a supporter of a lot of the programs. If you want more information, our website is interfaithunderstanding.org, and we have a lot of information there. We have um, weekly newsletters with reflections and insights that are written by either myself or the director, Doug Kinchy, who many of you are familiar with. That's also in the Grand Rapids Press, Muskegon Chronicle, and Kalamazoo Gazette. And we have monthly meetings as well that people are welcome to join where you can help plan what interfaith service projects will look like in our community. And I hope that um, we'll continue to partner with Fountain Street Church on a lot of these initiatives. So thank you very much.
couple of passages to uh, set the table for what I hope will be a nourishing meal. Uh, in the <clears throat> Revised Common Lectionary used amongst most Protestant and some Catholic churches, there's this passage from the book of Revelation, a, a portion of it. It's much longer than the part I'm reading. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city. On either side of the river is the tree of life with its twelve kinds of fruit, producing its fruit each month, and the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. That's one. Ed Simon, who writes for a website called Religion Dispatches, which I commend to you. It's a group of academics writing about religion in modern America, notably. Had this to say this week. He writes, May 1st, 1628 was the second time that Thomas Morton had erected a maypole at his colony in Marymount, Massachusetts but it was to be the decisive event in getting him arrested and exiled by his fellow Englishman. Morton, the forgotten cavalier poet who was one of New England's founders, envisioned an alternative America starkly different from that of his nemesis, William Bradford, governor of Plymouth. As Nathaniel Hawthorne put it two centuries later, jollity and gloom were contending for an empire. And from Washington, the Washington Post this morning. The housing bubble was a broadly shared experience. Values rose rapidly in communities across the country in the early 2000s. But what happened next was not. The bust was more severe in black Stockton, California than in white San Francisco. The recovery was stronger in the white parts of the District of Columbia than in the black suburbs. The pain of the bubble has lingered longer in African-American neighborhoods in metro Atlanta than white neighborhoods. The result is that this housing cycle, spanning the bubble, bust, and recovery, has left vastly different marks on communities across the country. For some families and neighborhoods, the legacy will linger for years. For others, its memory has already faded. I give you this because black lives matter. Yes, it's May Day. May Day. And in this region, we mean it just like that, that spring may yet come here before summer. Up north where I was this week, as you've heard, the trees are still, still very skeptical. They're withholding their leaves. But even down south, we find ourselves on May Day wearing sweaters and jackets. We are a people of faith, Michiganians. At least the fruit growers are still happy. We'll give them that. Speaking of faith, the, the book of Revelation is essentially a preposterous, wild act of faith. Some vision of a future, some hope for which the present simply gives no support. Reason cannot get us from here to there in the book of Revelation. But dreams, dreams can often seem quite real. We've all awakened from a dream and wondered if it wasn't quite true. And for those whose lives are a nightmare, a dream is what keeps them going from day to day against insurmountable odds. And the more vivid that dream, sometimes the better. The passage from Revelation this morning is a source of a song that some of you have heard. Aaron Copeland said it very beautifully, shall we gather at the river? That's the river they're referring to, the river that the angel showed, the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God. The song part, the song version, was written during the Civil War when thousands of families were separated as young men went down into the Confederacy, and men from the Confederacy went away from home to fight an awful war. Its chorus, though, you'll note, is a question. Shall we gather at the river? And it was sung in the hope of reunion. 
that the men and boys who perished on the battlefield would somehow be reunited in heaven with their families at the river that flows by the throne of God. The rather common idea of heaven as a place where families are reunited was always around, but it took on particular value during the American Civil War and is now the most dominant image when people say they want to go to heaven. What do they want to do? They want to be reunited with their families, a notion that became powerfully important during the age of the Civil War when most people never ventured more than 10 miles from their homes and you went out in the back 40 and you saw the graves of your ancestors, families and land in a perpetual embrace. It was not just the thought of dying that terrified both the men, boys, and families of the Civil War. It was the thought of dying alone, separate, apart. I love it when something familiar, like a song, proves to have deep roots. Let's look at Groundhog Day just three months ago. At least three traditions are piled one atop the other. One of them that you may not know about unless you're a good Catholic is called Candlemas. You'll notice it ends with the same word, mus, that Christmas does because it comes 40 days after Christmas and celebrates the purification of the Virgin, meaning the time of sequestration when women, having had children, had to withdraw from society until their lochia had finished drying up. And so she came back to the temple that day. In, English, in, Eng, in Anglican tradition, there's a ceremony called the Churching of Women, which celebrates that same or honors that same rejoining of society. So Candlemas is the end of the Christmas season 40 days later and comes, not surprisingly, almost days before the beginning of Lent, which is yet another 40-day season, which generally lands when? Just about now. Underneath of Candlemas is the Lupercalia. What's that, you're saying? Well, that's a Roman festival, pre-Christian, and a fertility rite, and a, a Lupercal had to do with a, the hide of a, a well, the, the, I think it's the hide of a goat, and it was flung about with blood drops to make all the young women in Rome fertile so they can have children. It was a rather frolic some time, believe it or not. And underneath of that, a pagan festival up in the north parts of Europe called Imbolc, a festival of the approaching spring. This is all back around the 1st of February. And Germanic folks would predict the length of winter by consulting a badger, which we don't keep handy in the United States, so we borrowed groundhogs for the occasion. No kidding. All three involve fertility in some way, the celebration of its product, a child, the awaiting of another in Lupercalia, and the rise of spring for the crops. You see where I'm going? Somehow all of these things get all blended together, and we don't even notice it because they're in the background of our lives. Way back around November 1st, it happened again. As winter approached, ancient Europeans would cel celebrate a, a, a festival called Samhain, when the spirits of the dead were able to visit the living and therefore respect was owed them to assure they wouldn't bother you in the future. That's why Christianity either created or adopted the time to be the festival of all saints and all souls that dearly departed. And of course, we get Halloween from that. And then there is May Day, which in its ancient form, called Beltane, involved tree worship, because they're going to give fruits. And we decorated the, the May trees, and these eventually became the May poles around which we danced and created all those wonderful braided ribbons. Okay, this is all very interesting, and part of the whole pluralism thing is to appreciate that no religion is actually separated from any other religion. They all interpenetrate like a, like a forest where the leaves and the, and the roots and the grasses all depend upon one another. That's very interesting, and that's a great lesson. Take that and go with it. But there's more. It turns out that cultures everywhere 
are always planted on top of other cultures, uh, like houses. You may think you're in the first house that was there, but you're probably wrong. We don't see it as much if you go to other older parts of the world where human habitations are longer built. It's hard to find a city that wasn't built on a city that wasn't built on a town. This church was not the first building on this spot. There was a previous church that was here called Fountain Street Baptist Church. And while we don't see it anymore, it stood right here. And even the first buildings in Grand Rapids stood on ground that was used as camping sites for the native tribes that met here at this part of the state to trade, which is why across the river, if you're in Anabawen Park, you can see those mounds which were recreated to give honor to the Indian mounds where the dead were buried, but which we wonderful white people leveled in order to put sawmills and warehouses in. In Europe, pagan culture was suppressed by the Christian monarchs. In India, the Persian Muslims demolished Hindu temples to create masjids. We build our cultures on top of other cultures all the time. And here's the important part. We never completely destroy them, even when we try. It lingers in paths that end up becoming roads that we travel. It lingers in fields that eventually become town squares. In rituals, we continue to honor and then come up with new, self, new reasons for doing them. Last week, I spoke of the abuse of the notion of purity. It's good to have pure foods and pure medicines, of course, but it's a bad thing to have pure races and pure religions, if only because it's impossible to have them. Few people are as white as I am. I tell myself I'm kind of cream of white guy. I sent in my DNA to find out how white I was. 98%, but only 98%. Lurking at the bottom there was something North African, something Eastern European. Yay! (laughs) And that's true for every one of us. Every one of us has a mixture of everything. It may not be equally so, but dig down in your bones, in your soil, in your house, in your culture, in your nation, and in your religion, the world lurks. Just like all the genes that you're carrying around belong to a plant and an animal and a fish and a tree and other humans. You cannot be pure. It's not possible. And this is important for us because we, religious liberals, are children not of Mr. Morton and his Maypole, but Mr. Bradford and his Puritans. The religious movement we call liberal religion grew out of the Calvinist part of the Protestant Reformation. It did. And in all honesty, the the Protestant Reformation had a point. The Catholic Church had gotten rather messy and rather lazy about its Christianity. It needed a little criticism. But... Once you start asking one question, you've got to ask two and three and four, and before you know it, you're changing everything. And the ones that came to America came from England first, but they later came from Germany and became known as the Evangelical and Reformed. And here in, and here in West Michigan, the Dutch came and established their Calvinist imprint. And strange as it, as it seems, it is these most fervent reformers, the Calvinists, from which the American liberal experience arose. It seems they, they, we, really believe that notion that we hear around here often, that the church must not be merely reformed, but ever reforming. But the point I'm trying to make is that we have, we, religious liberals, we open-hearted, open-minded people, actually are fairly puritanical if we're not careful. I've seen religious liberals who are rather dogmatic. How can anyone believe in God? What a dumb idea. I'm a liberal after all. Let that sit in for a minute. I've known some liberal religion, li- religious liberals who look down on those who continue to believe in silly things. We are as susceptible to snobbery and puritanical and dogmatic notions of religion as anyone else. And if you don't think so, there's my proof. 
Many years ago, when I was a student of religion in seminary, I had to read a lot of books. I've kept a lot of them. One that stuck with me, a pioneering work in the comparative religion movement of the early 20th century, was called, it's a very academic title, Religion in Essence and Manifestation by the Dutch scholar, believe it or not, Gerardus van der Leeuw, in his chapters at the end of the book, on which he explained how one should approach the comparative study of religion, methodological essays they were, he wrote something that has stuck with me forever. When the professor, he writes, is told by the barbarian that once there was nothing except a great feathered serpent, unless the learned man feels a thrill and a half temptation to wish it were true, he is no judge of things at all. We, purported liberals of faith, need to reclaim the original meaning of the word, which is generous, and cultivate that in our experience of others and other religions. None are pure, because all are human. None are simple, because all are human. It behooves those of us who question religious dogma to question our own judgments about them, as well as those of others. And then, and then, not only to question our own capacities to judge, but to elevate our capacity to see the truth in things we do not like. There is a revelation even in feathered serpents, in maypoles, in the river that is crystal that flows by the throne of God. There is a truth in there ready to talk to us if we are ready to listen with unbiased ears. There is some truth lurking in every Bible if we are willing to let it speak to us rather than debate it. There is a truth in the whirling of prayer wheels across the Himalayas. There is a truth hiding in every masjid and every prostration. Something about the human spirit exists authentically in every practice and belief, even though it may be covered with encrustations of error and misgiving, even though it might be wrapped in falsehoods, there is something alive in every hope that is expressed. And even our most elevated notions and clarified conclusions and perfected points of view have inside them something of the wild prayer of longing, as Dawden put it, this earthy, human, inchoate desire for the universe to be alive, the one that drives every one of us to hope for something unbelievable, even if we don't know exactly what it is. I think this is our touchstone if we are honest with ourselves. The hope, the dream, the fantasy that drives us humans to imagine feathered serpents in the first place, to believe even coincidentally in magic groundhogs, to pass a little salt over our shoulders, to give time to ghosts and angels, and even sometimes to the celestial cities that drop out of heaven we might even find ourselves believing in eternal and happy family reunions. We all have a religion beyond belief, one that does not settle for something mere words can say. We want more. We need more. And if we have any genius in this world, it is because we know that mere words are not enough and we don't want to get trapped inside them. But the longing is there. The hope, the dream, whatever it is that propels us through life, it is as true for us as anyone. And why we cannot find that in each other and across cultures is a sadness 
that I carry with me every day. On my first long walk back in 2012, I walked across England along Hadrian's Wall. It was meant to keep out the barbaric Scots. It didn't work. When I reached the Irish Sea after a week, rain had soaked me through and through, and there was only a little hut by the sea, blown full of rain from the sea. In a town of scarcely a thousand people, it was an undramatic end to a long week. No one was there to greet me. No angels were at the gates. No families were there to take me in. Even when I went to Santiago, Spain, with its magnificent cathedral and pilgrims all about, or in Hachisan in Japan, a tall waterfall, the tallest in the country, even Cadillac, Michigan, was a disappointment. <laughs> because it was the sacredness of the journey. And each journey in some way brings me closer to whatever calls me on. I am not at all convinced we will gather at the river, but I do hope, personally, to get closer to whatever it means to be alive, to be human. And now that I think about it, if shall we gather at the river is not our song, maybe another one comes closer, just closer, just a closer walk with thee. Maybe that's our hope, to travel together, to get closer to one another, to find that place where I and thou can be on the same path, share a dream, have a hope, be alive. I think that we'll just have to do. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be found true in thy sight, thou who art my rock and my Redeemer. Thank you. We are going to conclude our worship with a wonderful hymn. It, allow, it requires you to talk about God. If that's a problem, get over it. Because it isn't a problem. Remember, God is the way we talk about what matters.